this song so many times that it can become a little repetitious. And you just say the words without visualizing the intention. And then God just showed me the nation. He said, visualize yourself in this song as the nation. Visualize yourself as the nation. And whatever you ask, you will receive. Just open up your mouth. said ask and you would give the world we say yes heaven come to earth we We now believe as we ask for the nation, you will remember all that you promised we ask, Lord, we Oh, that is mine. It's all yours. 
you sacrifice it all. Hallelujah. Come on, you can do better than that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, put your hands together and give him a good praise in the house. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. 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 We thank God for his wonderful favor, and we can ask him, amen? Ask and you shall receive. We thank you that our faith is rising. As we believe you, as we remember your promises, our faith is rising. Amen, amen. It's always an honor and, and privilege to come, but today we, we thank God for ministry children of the house. The whole congregation, I consider my children, but we thank God for those particularly uh, uh, right now in, in ministry that God has spoken to and called, and we've honored them and set them aside and, and confirmed what they've been called to do. And so today we, we're glad to, to have a son in two ways come forward, my natural son and my spiritual son, to come and minister the word today. And when I first asked him, he said, he said, I, I, don't, I don't know. And then he, he thought about that thing and, and reconsidered quickly and said, I think I got a few, few pieces of something to put together. So I prayed that God would piece it all together for him. And, and so I called to encourage him yesterday. I put on an old preacher voice and said, I just called to tell you that, <laughs> that the Lord is going to use you. He's going to use you and not me. To, And so, so he, he, he received. <laughs> he didn't have a choice. So. <laughs> so, so I want you to receive him. Amen. Come on, LaSalle. Minister LaSalle. Oh, 
I see it. Repeat after me. This is my Bible. <laughs> he is right. Uh, it was last Friday when he called me, and it wasn't something that was even on my mind at the, at the time. I was, I was in the parking lot of Home Depot <laughs> doing some more uh, things on the honey-do list as, we, as we've all done during this, this quarantine time. And he said, I want you to get a, get a word together. I said, I said, when? And he said, uh, next Sunday. I said, what? <laughs> no, not this Sunday coming up next Sunday. Um, okay, let me, let me think about it. And in my mind, you know, because we are preachers and ministers of the gospel, you always have pieces of messages that you just kind of store away, a, a nugget here, a nugget there. And as you're listening to pastor, you're listening to, you know, whoever your, your other favorite, you know, preacher might be, and you're, you're studying and you're edifying yourself. You say, oh, well, this piece will go with that. And this piece can go over here. And so I had pieces of things to put together. But it wasn't the piece that God wanted for this time. So I end up wasting time during the week for about three days. I wrestled with probably about four different subjects, four of those different nuggets. I said, okay, I could put this piece here. And, and then I'd run to a brick wall and okay, well, let me switch gears and see if this one will work. And all of them I thought were appropriate for this time, but God kept saying, not necessarily no. I'm still going to keep those nuggets in my notes. He just said, not yet. So when he finally gave it to me, when I finally listened to him, he said, now you can rest. Because this is what I want the people of God to hear in this time. So I thank Pastor for this opportunity. I, I, this is something I never take lightly. I always want to make sure that when I come before the people of God that it's edifying and that it's sound and that it will lift us up and edify us, educate us, and fire us up to go to the next place that God wants us to go. So I thank Pastor, I thank my fellow ministers, I thank my, my wife and my children who thought enough to pray for me this morning and even lay hands on me. Yeah, Lou even laid hands on me this morning. <laughs> so that's where I got a little extra fire on it. Because out of the mouths of babes, you have perfected praise. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we have to feast on your word. And now, God, we ask the heavens to open and give us rain. God, we ask that you speak to us in this time. And not only speak, but give us ears to hear what you're saying to us. Thank you for this word of encouragement. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, say after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. This book calls me an overcomer, and that's who I am. Today I shall be taught the infallible, unchanging, word of God. So my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. As I gladly receive the word today, I believe that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen.
one of my many goals whenever I get up to speak before the people of God is to do battle. When I wake up in the morning, I want to give the devil a black eye. So while I'm usually jovial in nature, there's always a part of me that's ready for a fight. So with that, I want to ask a question. That question is going to be today's title. What happens when there isn't enough? What a question during this time. What happens when there isn't enough? God's promises are always attached to principles. I want to remind you that your greatest opportunities will come at the most inopportune times. Also keep in mind that the word you resist is often the one you need the most. So you got to lean in today. So to answer the question, what happens when there isn't enough, is that God makes sure you have more than enough. We don't like to admit that there are times when we operate from deficit places. In this social media age, we like to stunt. We like to stunt for the gram. You know, post the good times on Facebook, post the vacation pictures, and oh, look at me and my family by the pool. But what we don't post is the argument that we had on the flight down. No one knows that part. They see, the, they see the glorified parts. But there's a particular text that I want to draw your attention to. And it's 2 Kings chapter 4. The reason I like this text from 2 Kings 4 is because it seems like a small, little, practical, almost incidental miracle on the surface. Yes, miracles happen in the Old Testament too. But understanding the surrounding context and the life of the prophet Elisha, he just finished solving a problem for three kings. Right after this, he performs a great miracle for a very wealthy woman. And sandwiched in between those two magnificent miracles on a grand scale, where he's consulting political advisors like a real prophet would, and where he's hanging out with a top donor, there's something that happens that seems so small on the surface. One of the sons of the prophets had died in Shunem. He left a widow and two little children. The creditor, according to the Mosaic law, had the right which he was about to put into practice, of taking the children to be bondmen, servants, slaves. And so the penniless, helpless woman comes to Elisha as a kind of deliverer general of sorts from all sorts of distress and tells him her pitiful tale. But let's read through this passage and I'll pull out a few things along the way. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. Does your pastor know that you fear the Lord? Can someone come to pastor on your behalf and say, pastor, such and such happened? Is pastor going to search for your record of servitude? Will he have anything to find? 
That's why she had an ear with the prophet, because of her relationship with who served him. It's a sidebar. Okay. Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. Verse 2. Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. Now let's pause right there for a second. I would love to see the look on her face when he says this. I know how I would look, and my family does too because I have a particular reputation when it comes to customer service. If I'm having a particular issue, I have no problem picking up the phone to see if it can be resolved. And now after I've been on hold for, you know, 10 minutes or so, and I've had my fill of elevator music, some gleeful customer service rep tells me their name and asks how they can assist me. So I will clearly and concisely lay out the issue. Sometimes it goes smoothly. Other times it doesn't. There are times when I have to repeat the same story multiple times to the same agent. So in my mind, that's how the widow feels in this moment. And sometimes you do too, because at the end of that call they say, how did I assist you today, or can I assist you with anything else? Well, you didn't help with what I called you with in the first place. So why would I give you another problem to solve if you didn't solve this one? So, in my mind, that's how the widow feels in this moment. Didn't you hear what I just said? I have one small jar with a little bit of oil. The last thing I need is multiple empty jars to remind me of what I don't have. Moving on to verse 4. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Shut out the noise. Then pour into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass, or it happened, when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. Say amen, somebody. Amen. She minimized what she had, but for God, it was enough to work with. Is it possible that you are overlooking what you have because you're so focused on what you lost? What you have might be small, but that does not matter to God. Elisha knew this, and so did his mentor, Elisha. Elijah. So if you allow me a brief sidebar, we won't read it now, but in your notes, write down 1 Kings 18, 41 through 46. This is a must-read scripture for every believer. What's happening in that story is that the land of Samaria, so when you're talking about that Middle Eastern area where most of the Bible occurred, even, even from the Great Commission, we talk about first Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria. So this is the outskirts. This is the outskirts. This is Samaria. 
they're in the midst of a three and a half year drought. No rain. We thank God for rain today because July was dry and your grass is a testimony of the lack of rain that we received in the month of July. So we are in the midst in this particular story of a three and a half year drought. And Elisha, in the midst of prayer, says, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. What do you mean rain? It hasn't rained in three and a half years, and now you hear rain? I hear the sound of abundance of rain. So he says to his servant, go up and look. So the servant runs up to the mountain one time, comes back with the report. I see nothing. Two times. Up and back. Three, four, five, six. Number six, imperfection. Man's number. Incomplete vision. But on that seventh trip, he says, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. Whether you want to take that literally or figuratively, maybe you've looked in the clouds and you see a really, really small cloud that's about that size. Maybe you hold your fist up and you're able to cover the cloud with your fist through your vision. Either way, it's a small cloud. Yeah, yeah. But that was enough for God to work with because when Elisha heard the report that there was a cloud the size of a man's hand, he told the servant to run and tell Ahab to get in his chariots and go so that the rain won't stop him. And as he's running, that cloud got joined with some company. And the same dark clouds that you drove through today to get here, they gathered and the rains came and the drought was over. Yeah. Say it again. Say the drought is over. <laughs> a little cloud, a little oil. So back to the widow. Her need was greater than her supply. The enemy wanted her to despise her oil because the miracle was in what she was overlooking. She was looking to make some money, but she had nothing to sell. She didn't have anything to put on eBay or Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. So the prophet questions her, not only about what she doesn't have in her house, but what she does have. But the oil only flows when it's poured. I'll say it again. The oil only flows when it is poured. Don't say you'll pour more when you get more. In God, it becomes more when it's poured. I don't have much. Pour it out. Get your chariot ready. The cloud is only this big. I've got plenty of time. I've got a little flour and a little oil. Make me a cake first. The Bible is full of crazy instructions. As you pour it out, it becomes more. Bitterness will keep you from pouring out what you have when waiting for what you want. So you stay stuck in neutral, in a poor mindset. You want someone to pour into you, but you haven't poured into anyone else. Yeah. The more you pour, the more it flows. Yeah. They kept bringing her vessels, and the oil continued to flow. It was only when they ran out of vessels that the oil stopped. It is my belief that even to this day, if vessels continued to show up, the oil never would have stopped. Where are your vessels? Where are your vessels? God will always provide for us, but he will often ask us to step out in faith and do our part first. Our obedience or disobedience doesn't change God's character, yeah. but it will change our outcome. Yeah. 
God multiplied what she identified as her only possession. There's no limit to how God could have showed up and showed out on her behalf, but he made himself personal to her by using the only thing she said she had. Alexander McLaren says it this way, you have in God, you have God in the measure in which you desire him. Only remember that the desire that brings God must be more than a feeble, fleeting wish. Wishing is one thing. Willing is quite another. Lazily wishing and strenuously desiring are two entirely different postures of mind. The former gets nothing, and the latter gets everything, gets God, and with God, all that God can bring. So that's the Old Testament. Some of you don't like the Old Testament. Maybe the names are too hard to pronounce. Maybe a few too ites in there, Hittites and Shunammites and Jebusites and Ammonites. So let's switch gears to one of the two events in Jesus' life that's recorded in all four Gospels. Of all the things that he did, four different accounts of his life story, and there are two instances that are recorded in each and every one. One is obviously the resurrection because it's the central piece and they all knew that was the central piece of our faith. But the other mention in all four is the feeding of the multitude. So let's turn to John's account. That's John chapter 6. Jesus' fame is starting to spread throughout the land. He's already healed a nobleman's son, and he healed the lame man by the pool of Bethesda. So the crowd is getting bigger. Everyone wants to see who or what is next. We've been there. When we first started our new walk in Christ, we were in it for what God was doing for us and had not yet progressed to what God could do through us. So while you're in John chapter 6, let's start with verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain and sat there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. I'm so glad I'm in a relationship with an all-knowing Savior. He already knew what he was going to do. It's one of the many reasons I can put my faith in him, because he already knows. So he knows I don't have to. I can just follow. It's easier that way, less stressful that way. He knows, follow him, it happens. Simple formula. Verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. 200 denarii translates to about eight months worth of wages for that time. One of his disciples, Andrew, another reason why I like this story is because of all the disciples, this is the one time Andrew speaks. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad here 
who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? What do you do when there isn't enough? Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, in number about 5,000. 5,000 men. The miracle looks even greater when you consider everyone who was there, because when you factor in women and children, that number easily swells to 20,000. For sake of reference, when I always look at this scripture, I think about the now defunct palace of Auburn Hills, who, when the Pistons were in their, their prime in the, in the early and mid-2000s, they consistently sold out every home game. That attendance was 22,076. So we're looking at a similar crowd with two fish and five loaves. You know what those concession stands look like. Two fish and five loaves won't go far. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, even Jesus was thankful for the little. He distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down. Jesus gave thanks. He distributed to the disciples. Disciples distribute to the people. And likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. Can you be thankful over the little bit? It doesn't look like it will be enough, but give thanks for it. Then something miraculous happens in verse 12. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Wait, what? Now we just read earlier that the little boy's lunch was two fish and five loaves. These weren't loaves of bread you would buy from a grocery store. These are small round flat breads about the size of a hand. There, so verse 13, therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Twelve baskets left. One for each disciple who helped distribute the food to the crowd. So again, we ask this text the same question that we ask the Old Testament text. What happens when there isn't enough? The answer is that when there isn't enough, God makes sure that you have more than enough. Yeah. Jesus says, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, more than enough. So when the disciples were presented with what appeared to be an insurmountable situation, when most would have said, just send everyone home, Andrew says, it's not much, but we have a little boy's lunch. Remember earlier I said that God's promises are attached to principles and that great opportunities come at inopportune times. The Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, so these principles must stay in effect. We already saw what he did for the widow with a little bit of oil. And now we see what he does with a little bit of food. When God speaks to you, he reminds you that he is the God of more than enough. He reminds you that he is not slack 
concerning his promises. He reminds you that in him all of his promises are yes and amen. He is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, and he is El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. The disciples said, send the crowds away. They were presented with an opportunity to make a difference. Remember, Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Well, here they are. But they couldn't see the opportunity through the lens of inconvenience. What perspective are you looking from? Are you Philip? Or are you Andrew? Are you seeing things the way Philip did? As an inconvenience? An inopportune time? Or not enough to go around? Or can you see it the way Andrew does? Two different disciples. Disciples, followers of Christ. Both of them followers. But still two different perspectives. Two different vantage points. I'm not knocking Philip. We need Phillips who will count up the costs. But we also need Andrews who will acknowledge that when a situation rises up, it could be that the answer is already there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if you can't see it because of what's currently in front of you, you can look in your past and remember what God has done for you and as the scriptures say, build yourself up on your most holy faith. It's the past victories that help you see that if he did it before, he can do it again. Yeah. It's yeah. the times in studying the word that I know if he did it for the widow in 2 Kings, he can do it for me. If he can do it for David, who took down Goliath, with a small, smooth stone, small thing. Don't overlook the small things. Yeah, yeah. A small, smooth stone took down a giant. If he can alter the nature of a ravenous bird and make it feed his prophet Elijah, I know he can do some supernatural stuff for me. If he, the all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present God, can take a little boy's lunch and feed a multitude of people, I know he can do it for me. If he can bless my family with a, if he can bless my family with a new house, my family member, I know he can do it for me. If I've been faithful over my car and paying the note and doing the necessary things and my friend gets a new car, gets blessed with a new car, I know that mine is on the way. I said it earlier and I'll say it again. He is El Shaddai, able to give substance to many at once. Jesus knew something his disciples didn't know because he came from somewhere they had not been. He performed the miracle and fed the people. Then later in that same chapter, he reveals part of himself to the people. Verse 35, Jesus said to, him, to them, I am the bread of life. Yeah. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. God will never ask anything from you that he will not give you. My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. The widow said, I have this little bit of oil. Andrew said, we have this little bit of food. But how far will it go among so many? Her answer was in, was in the empty vessels, because as long as the vessels remained, the oil continued to flow. Andrew's answer was in his basket. Because Jesus blessed and broke the bread, he gave it to the disciples as tribute to the crowd, and I have to believe 
that as Andrew kept reaching in the basket, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that his faith continued to grow. Maybe he thought at some point it would run out. But at what point was his faith justified and increased? Was it when he got part of the way through the crowd? Maybe it was at the halfway point. Maybe he got to the last group that was sitting in orderly fashion on the hillside, and he passed them their portion, and he looked in the basket, and it was still full. See, they're in separate areas of this crowd. So he's looking in his basket. He doesn't know that there are 11 other full baskets. Maybe it's when they gathered back together that they realized the miracle that occurred. But that's not the only small thing that God works with. The disciples had an encounter that their measure of faith wasn't, wasn't e enough for. They didn't exercise enough of their measure of faith. I'll say it that way. Matthew 17, 20. They had tried to cast out a demon, and the demon did not flee. So they came back to Jesus, and Jesus, in a teaching moment, said to them, because of your unbelief. That's the answer why you couldn't do it. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. All of us were given the measure of faith, the single measure. Wasn't portioned out any differently to any person. But the mustard seed is, a, is an interesting example. And I've actually seen you know, a mustard seed. Back when spice racks were a thing and you display those in your kitchen, quite often there was a little jar of mustard seeds and in true PK fashion in the back of my head, I said, you know, that might be good for a, a faith example later on. So I've seen a mustard seed. It's really small. It can actually fit on the tip of a ballpoint pen. So if you're taking notes, just kind of pause for a second and look at the tip of your pen. It's where a mustard seed would fit. Something that small can move a mountain. That's why I despise some of the, I, I love some of the old songs of the church, but there were some that are just so scripturally unsound. I said, why are we singing, I'm coming up on the rough side of the mountain, when God said, speak to the mountain, and it'll move. So I'll read the last verse again. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. What do you do when there isn't enough? You put your faith in God who is more than enough. Some of you already know he's more than enough. Amen? Amen. Whenever a preacher is preaching, you, 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 you get messages too. I heard of a few things that I could just blow into some stuff. And one came from the, from the John passage. I think it was that sixth verse. It, it talked about how Jesus said, how, how, how it was said of Jesus, he, he, he knew what he would do. We serve a God that already knows what he's going to do. It might be rough on your side, but he knows he's going to bring you out. He knows what he's going to do. And in every situation that Lou ministered to today, scriptural situation, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and then over in the New Testament, 
each one of those situations, there was something crucial that they, they did. They gave it to God first. They gave it first. And see, we think we gain by keeping it because I know my situation. So we hold on to it. But nothing happens until you release it in faith. And you got to release. Because what you have is not enough. I think it was, it, it, I, 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 I want to call his name right. I don't know whether it was, it might not have been John Avazini. If, what, if the seed is not enough to meet your need, give your seed away. But we are perpetually ready for the Last Supper. We eat it up. Because we're ready for the Last Supper. And we keep saying, I don't have enough. I don't have enough. When all you need to do is look at what you have. I'd like the scripture where it says, it, 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 the prophet asked the, the woman, what do you have? I, I, don't, I, I don't have anything except a little. Instead of going straight to, I've got some oil. But we've always got to present our deficit. I don't have nothing but. <laughs> when the but is all you need. The exception is what's going to make the difference. And we spend time and time again not producing because we overlook just simple biblical lessons that teach us how to gain and to get. And the oil will keep flowing if you keep showing up with vessels. It only stopped when there was nothing else to put anything in. I was sitting there, I said, beside my son, I'd have told my son, Tell some people I'll pay them to send their jars to me. <laughs> Keep bringing jars until the neighborhood look like a pottery barn. <laughs> he just wants to know if he's going to bless you, you're going to keep pulling out something for him to pour it in. Are you out there? So we thank him for the word. Well, those are some of the nuggets I picked up. I don't know what any other preachers got, but uh, how many heard something that was going to bless your life? Amen. Young people get that lesson early. Learn it quick. Learn to surrender to God first. And it will set the rest of your life. You don't have to be in your middle ages or your late age still trying to make it. You can make it in your young days. I'm telling you, it'll work. Just trust him over it. Well, let's give God some praise for, for Minister Lucille. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. We thank him. We thank him. While every head is bowed, eyes are closed. If you are in this room and you haven't surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is available to you today. He's the God of more than enough. And salvation for us was God's more than enough. That he gave his only. See, the reason why God can require us to give him is because he it's the pattern that he operates out of. He gives his best and his only to us. He gave his only son to us. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if you're in this room and you haven't given him your life, you can surrender your life to him. We're not going to ask you to walk or do anything else other than follow a few simple instructions. And that is surrender your life to the Lord. 
If you're here and you want to be saved, you want to give him your life, it's easy. Just slip up a hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else. We're not going to embarrass you. Next thing I would ask you is to make a confession. Accept him into your heart. But if you want to give him your life while you're in this room today, just slip up a hand and say, I want to be saved. I want God's more than enough, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, pray. Praise the Lord again. To all of our listeners, we thank God for you, and we encourage your financial support of this ministry. We are here to bless you and know that the Lord will bless your giving. You can use PayPal by going to our website at dovechurch.org slash giving, which takes you to our PayPal page. We appreciate your sharing this time with us today. God bless you.